Chapter 27, Finding a Pigeon. They stood on the abandoned track, staring at the graffiti that the Matt Hennaberry tagged was isolated from the others, except for Dominic P.H. next to it. Matt Hennaberry was an alias we used sometimes, March said. Alfie thought it was the friendliest name in the world. Who's Dominic? Izzy asked. It must be someone else, March said. Alfie never used that name. He blinked hard. I thought he didn't leave me a message. Just random stuff. But he did leave me this. What does it mean? Izzy asked. I don't know. The exhilaration was wearing off. Alfie had left him a message that he couldn't read. Again. March closed his fist around the key in his pocket. Come home. Where, Alfie? Where is home? He stared until his eyes were burning. Izzy and Darius were quiet. Finally, Darius's hand landed on his shoulder. It was enough to buckle his knees. It's okay, bro. You'll figure it out. Time to get moving. Yes, he should get moving. A train roared into a platform nearby. People coming, people going, all around them. They needed a direction, too. Figure out what you have, figure out what you need, then use what you have to get what you need. He had a custom-made jacket with British tailoring. He needed cash. I have a plan, March said. It's time for a pigeon drop. The students at the Huntington Chumley School wore uniforms. March remembered this from his time in New York with Alfie. They'd run a job that required March to look like a fancy private school kid, so Alfie had taken him to the Farquay Mooney thrift shop, and they'd purchased a navy blazer. March had worn it to a dinner with Alfie and a former South American military, military dictator. A month later, the dictator had discovered his secret offshore account had been drained. That job had finished had financed a lease on a house in the Scottish countryside. That had been a good year until Alfie had been tempted to lift a painting from some earl's wall and they had to leave the country quickly. Don't be an owl. Don't look back. It was time for school when they reached the Huntington Chumley campus. Mothers and nannies were heading to school, the mothers wearing skinny pants and sky-high heels and carrying purses made of leather so soft and supple it made it look like candy. The nannies wore cardigans and loafers and pushed strollers with the younger siblings of the elite students. They're going to rule the world one day, Darius said. Pearl! March lounged against the brick wall across the street, his eyes moving. What are we looking for? Darius asked. Patterns. Habit is our best friend. Watch who walks with the kid, who doesn't. Who's a nanny, who's a mom. Who chats with the other moms, who doesn't. We have to pick our pigeon. We'll run the con tomorrow. We don't have time for a second chance. This is Wednesday. The party is Friday night. Across the street, a black Mercedes sedan drew up. A uniformed driver got out and walked a small girl, maybe five years old, into the building, holding her hand. March glanced at his watch. He shifted his attention to a woman walking with a young boy, maybe eight or nine. She was dressed the same as the other woman, but just a bit more. Her purse was bright pink, not the discreet shades of the others. Her heels were higher, her bracelets were thicker, her hair too blonde. He watched as she said hello to the other moms and how they responded with tight smiles and turned away. Meanwhile, the uniformed driver came out, saluted a teacher standing on the stairs, and headed for his car. As he drove off, a Range Rover pulled up. The kid got out and ran into the building. The two blonde mom waved at the Range Rover driver but looked crestfallen when the car just zoomed away. Her kid gave up trying to say goodbye to her and walked into school. The pigeon drop is an old con, but it still works. March said. The trick is to mix it up with the new details. The basic con is this. You drop a bag of money on the sidewalk, then wait for a mark to come. You pick it up. You say, wow, look at all this money. What should we do? And you work it out eventually that the mark gives you his wallet while he takes the bag and stuffs it in his pocket or down his pants or whatever. And then he walks off thinking he made a cool 5000 only he's got a bag of paper and you've got his wallet. What kind of pigeon would fall for that? Darius asked. Insecure, needy, social climber, March said. He pointed to the two blonde women with his chin. That one. Chapter 28, The Pigeon Drop. Shopping list. White shirt, striped tie, gray flannel pants, miniature Liechtenstein flags, knockoff designer briefcase, silly putty. Alfie had a saying, March told Darius and Izzy as he nervously fiddled with his tie the next morning. Find what you're hungry for. Our pigeon wants social status. She's not just walking her kid to school. She's looking to make a connection with those rich folks. The kid was beside the point, as he said. She hardly paid attention to him. Exactly. 
Those other moms were dissing her every single day, and she knows it. She's got money, but she doesn't belong. We're going to dangle what she wants in front of her. If all goes well, we'll walk away with at least a grand, and she'll have a good story. How do you know? Izzy asked, biting her lip. I don't, March said. When you run a con, you don't think about the odds. You think about details so you don't mess up. Alfie always said, if you're going to do something, don't do it stupid. We have just we ha just have to stay cool and stay smart. Ready? Yeah, Darius said. But why do I have to be the bad guy? Because you look scary, Izzy said. I do not. Do too. Guys, can we keep our eye on the con? At 8.23 a.m., the woman with the pink purse walked down the street with her son. Again, she nodded at the other mothers who offered brief, chilly smiles. The Mercedes pulled up, the driver got out, came around to the other side, and opened the door. The little girl got out and walked toward the school. Izzy hurried down the street. March watched as she slapped a silly putty on each side of the car's front hood and stuck the Lichtenstein flags in. March crossed the street and stood by the car. He dropped the fake designer briefcase they'd purchased from a street vendor downtown. The pink purse woman said goodbye to her son, who walked up the stairs. Darius suddenly loped around her, startling her. She clutched her purse closer. He ran past and snatched up March's briefcase, then dashed down the block. Oh no! March cried in an accent that Alfie called fake Romanian because it attached no particular country. Stop and de dib! With one glance, the woman took in the diplomatic flags and March in a blue blazer. She tottered over in her heels. I saw that street person, she said. He almost stole my purse. Are you all right? She looked around. We should tell security. No, wait, March said. They said back in Vaduz that New York is dangerous, but I, oh, he clapped his hands to his mouth. I hope I didn't. He searched in his chest pocket. Oh, I still have it. He took out the check that the gang had fabricated and worked over at a coffee shop. The school for, for the school trip to the super collider. He held out the check to make sure it was clearly visible. The woman's eyes widened as she took in a bank of Liechtenstein and the royal seal. The check was made out to Huntington Chumley School and was in the amount of $10,000. Ah, you're from Liechtenstein, yes. My papa is the new ambassador, and he has come to us, come with me to pay for the trip. But he receives a call, and he's off to our plane to fly for a meeting in Washington. Yes, that must happen often. He entrusts me with the check. And if it had been stolen, jail for me, I think. Heh. Instead, the criminal boy steals my new Vitan satchel. Perhaps I could talk to your mother for you. The Baroness? She's... The woman gulped. A Baroness? Let me call her for you on my phone. You seem upset. No, she is swimming her laps right now, March said. But I will tell you, tell her about your kindness, and you should come to the embassy for tea. The woman beamed. Oh, I'd love that, she stuck out her hand. Virginia Hayes. Gerard Richter, March said. Then he looked at the check again. Oh, nein, the, the check isn't signed. And today is the last trip for the day for the trip. Oh, but I'm sure the school, being who your father is, there's leeway. March's eyes filled with tears. It's the last day. My father won't forgive this, even though it was him who forgets to sign the check. Do I have time to get to the embassy before the day begins? He looked around wildly. Dear, you must calm down, Virginia Hayes said. I think I can help you. My bank is right around on that corner. Why don't I give you some money right now? I can't do $10,000, of course, but surely a portion for a deposit would hold your place. Oh, I could not ask. You didn't ask, dear. I offered. Well, maybe a thousand? March wiped his eyes. But I couldn't. Come with me, she said firmly. We wouldn't want to get the wrong impression. We wouldn't want you to get the wrong impression about America. Not after that horrible, grimy street person stole your lovely Vuitton bag. March swung in to step beside her. My mother shall call you for tea at the embassy. She will serve you our famous... I have no idea what this word is. Gunsunden heighten flacken. I think it's a made-up foreign word. And that's the end of that chapter. Chapter 29. Casing the Joint. March went through every bathroom at the Museum of Natural History. Since Murph the Surf's day, security had improved, to say the least. He could see no way in. What was Alfie thinking? You wanted me to pull off this heist, Pop. Give me a hint, will you? 
Thanks to Virginia Hayes, the three of them had shopped at the computer store and now had smartphones and a tablet. He texted Darius. No, look here. Where are you? Under the rail. He made his way to the Millstein Hall of Ocean Life. The hall was an enormous room with two levels of dioramas of fish and marine life. Hanging overhead was a model of a gigantic blue whale. This was the hall where the gala party would take place on Friday night, tomorrow night. He joined Darius and Izzy on the lower level, staring up at the whale. 94 feet long, 21,000 pounds, and made of fiberglass, Darius said. Adorable, March said. So, for the event, this whole space will be filled with tables, he frowned. Less than ideal conditions for a smash and grab. March strolled the perimeter. Guards, cameras, unmarked doors with signs that said emergency exit, alarm will sound, or no admittance. The best way out would be on the lower level. Always avoid the stairs if you can. But he could see weaving in and out of tables with an amber necklace in his hands. Any ideas? Darius asked. As Alfie used to say, the getaway is always the biggest problem. I'm worried about getting in, sure, but I'm mostly worried about getting out. There's security everywhere, and that's just the stuff I can see. There are always backup systems in place. Maybe Alfie didn't mean it literally, Darius said. Like, what's the lesson of the original job? What did your pop admire about it? Simplicity, March said. Visit the place, open a window, come back later. But that was in 1964. We've got alarms and guards. And people that night. And waiters, right? And a stage, Izzy said. March swiveled and regarded her. What? She seemed to shrink under the attention. For the choral concert, she said in a tiny voice. Leon is a big benefactor of the school choruses in New York City. They're picking the best ones of all of the private schools, and they're all going to sing at the beginning of the evening. March sprang forward and enveloped Izzy in a hug. She turned rosy. I did good? What are you thinking? Darius said. March smiled. Chapter 30. Nerves. March felt perspiration trickle under his collar. He kept his restless hands in his pockets. If he showed his nerves, Darius and Izzy would lose theirs. They stood across the street from the museum. They were now all wearing blue blazers and gray flannels. They had bought a comb and used it. They had gone over the plan. Now all they had to do was wait. How had Alfie done it? There had been many times when March waited in a hotel room while Alfie put on his dark clothes and went out on a job. March could sense his complete concentration, but not his nerves. How had Alfie, Alfie controlled his own jumping skin, the thoughts crowding his brain about the million things that could go wrong? Across the street, the museum sprawled for blocks. Massive gray stone with a grand entrance, tall columns, waving banners. Police barricades had been set up, and bored photographer stood behind them, checking their equipment. A red carpet ran from the sidewalk all the way up the grand steps. Suddenly, their plan seemed impossible, crazy, foolish, destined to brand them the incorrigible and land them in juvenile hall. March saw Darius swallow. You sure about this, Marco? I'm sure, he said. Inside his pockets, he crossed his fingers. Here's what we've got going for us. Nobody pays attention to kids. The security guys will be worried about the fancy folks. The fancy folks will be worried about looking good for each other. The museum people will be worried about the food and drinks and that everything runs smoothly. All we have to do is steal the necklace. Right, Darius said. That's all. After that, they'll want to get the chorus kids out as soon as possible so they can find the thief. I'll just walk out, walk out with it in my pocket. Easy peasy. Right, Darius said. Except for the part where we steal the necklace. That's hard. Sure, March said, or we could go back to Polestar and eat creamed corn. There was a short silence. Still in, March said. Still in. Chapter 31. Maximum Chaos. Lights winked on as twilight deepened. Floodlights illuminated the grand facade of the museum. The first limousine arrived, and a couple in formal wear headed up the wide stairs. Flash bulbs, bulbs popped for a second, then stopped. The woman in the flowered gown dropped her fake smile and looked disappointed. March kept his eyes on the photographers. That would be one way for Oscar Ford to sneak in. Or he and Jules could have already hidden themselves somewhere in the museum. Jules could be inside right now, her nerves pulled as taut as his. He touched the moonstone in his pocket. It made him feel closer to Alfie. If only you could absorb steel trap nerves and cool daring through a rock. The limousines were now a long line of waiting cars. 
March nudged Darius as a yellow school bus pulled up and a bunch of kids spilled out, dressed in black pants and white shirts. Them? Darius asked. Wait for the moment of maximum chaos. Not yet, March said. Five choral groups are coming. Somebody is always late. The later we go, the more pressure the people who will run this thing are under. That's when things get overlooked. The trickle of partygoers turned into a full blast faucet of tuxedos and bright spring gowns. Skinny, long necked women teetered out of limousines, posed, and slowly ascended the steps. One choral group after another arrived. March counted them off on his fingers. A red haired woman in a yellow and pink gown emerged from a limousine. She faced the photographers for long moments, allowing them to take hundreds of shots in an explosion of light and shutter noise. Something big gleamed from the neckline of her dress. Dolores Leon, Izzy said, and her necklace, March said. A few straggling party-goers hurried from limousines. A black band made an illegal U-turn and bumped to a halt just a few feet from where they stood watching. A nervous-looking woman jumped out and shouted, Come on! Get a move on! We're late! This is us, March said. His mouth felt dry. Students tumbled out of the van. The woman danced alongside the group, hurrying them forward. March looked at Darius and Izzy. Darius's gaze was glassy with fear. Now or never, March said. Darius gave a quick glance at Izzy. She nodded. Go, they whispered together. March ran forward and jogged alongside the frantic woman. You're late, too? <sighs> We're from Huntington, Chumley. Bradford, Bedford Prep. Traffic, she panted. Darius and Izzy dashed forward and attached themselves to the group as they ran toward a side door. An anxious young woman in a black dress peered out at them. Bedford Prep, the woman said, breathing hard. You're super late, the young woman said, frowning. Traffic. They're starting in ten minutes. Follow me. And just like that, they were in. March and Darius and Izzy followed the group down a dingy corridor and through the winding back corridors of the muse museum. They slipped into Milstein Hall from a back door marked No Admittance. March made a note of where it was and saw that you didn't need a key. Waiters were using it to run food to the tables. Stand on the risers, the young woman whispered, even though the noise from the crowd was a steady, loud buzz. The museum director will introduce you. You'll sing your number and then remain on the stage while your benefactor, Mrs. Leon, presents the necklace and the director makes a short speech. After that, the lights will go down, entrees will be served, and you'll exit out the same door. March joined the others on the risers. He scanned the crowd anxiously. He looked carefully at each waiter and waitress. No sign of Oscar or Jules. That would be the easiest way to get close to Dolores Leon, he supposed, though he wondered how Jules could pass for a server. She looked older than twelve, but not much older. This might be a good time to mention I can't sing, Darius whispered. Just mouth the words, March said. But what are they singing? I hate this, Izzy said. The director of the museum went to the microphone. She welcomed the crowd that went through and went through a list full of people to think. The crowd applauded politely. March's gaze roamed the crowd. If Jules was out there, what was she thinking? Alfie suddenly loomed in his head, his hand fluttering, saying, Find Jules. How would this old man feel if he knew his kids were now enemies, pitted against each other? March pushed the uncomfortable thought away. Jules had been the one to take off. She started this. And he was going to win it.